Here we go then. Mr Gum and the Biscuit Billionaire, Chapter 2. Meanwhile, over at Mr Gum's. Mr Gum was standing in front of the cracked mirror in his lonely bedroom of his Grimster house. Blow me down with an oil tanker. He was a horror. He hated children, animals, fun and every cartoon ever made. What he liked was snoozing in bed all day. In fact, although it was eight o'clock in the evening, Mr Gum had only just got up. For not only was he a horror, he was lazy too. So anyway, there he was in front of the mirror, getting ready to go out. You're up early, you handsome devil, he said to his reflection. What do you fancy doing today? I oh, fancy being even more evil than usual, <laughs> replied his reflection with a nasty laugh. Good idea, stupid, said Mr Gum. In that case, I'd better look me most frightful. He got a felt tip pen and he drew some extra scowls. There we go, some extra scowls on his forehead. Ugh, there we go. Then he scruffed up his big red beard to make it wild and as frightening as possible. It wasn't quite terrifying enough, so he stuck a couple of beetles in it and a photo of a shark. Ah, that should do it, he growled. Then he sprang downstairs, jumped on a skateboard he'd nicked off a six-year-old and he headed into town. On the high street, Martin Laundrette was about to close up his laundrette for the night when in came one last customer. It was Jonathan Ripples, the fattest man in town. Martin, please be careful with these, he said, handing over a bundle of clothes. They're very delicate. No problem, Big J, said Martin Laundrette reassuringly. I'll do them in cold water so they don't shrink or anything. But as he was putting the clothes into the machine, he noticed someone skateboarding badly up the high street, scowling as he went. Look, said Martin Laundrette, it's Mr Gum, and he's going into Billy William the Thirds. Oh dear, said Jonathan Ripples nervously, that can only mean trouble. While JR's head was turned, Martin Laundrette secretly turned up the washing machine from cold wash to super hot shrink wash. Then he took out a red notebook and he wrote, That Jonathan Ripples thinks he's so clever, but I'll have the last laugh. His clothes won't even fit me after this. Meanwhile, Mr Gum had jumped off his skateboard. He smashed it to bits, pulled off all the wheels and left it lying on the pavement to show everyone he was best. I'll win again, he smirked. Then he opened the door and went into Billy William the Third's right royal meets. Now, Billy William was the most revolting butcher in England, and that was official. A big greasy trophy stood in his shop window, and here is what it said, okay? England's most revolting butcher trophy, awarded to Billy William for the 20th year running. In fact, just keep the trophy forever. You always win. There's no point having the competition. You really are disgusting. So hardly anyone in town shot there, even though it was the only butchers around. Most people went to the next town to buy their meat or became vegetarian or only ate birdseed. But Mr Gum felt right at home there. Sometimes he wished the whole world could be exactly like Billy's, filled with entrails and slimy cow lips and rubbery old turkey necks. But he knew it would never happen. It was just a beautiful dream. Morning, me old suitcase, said Billy William as Mr Gum walked in. Want some entrails, he added, 
slurping up a load of bad meat off the counter with his grotty old tongue. No time for that, Caterpillar Joe, replied Mr Gum, which is what he sometimes called Billy when he was overexcited with evil. Ah, you're overexcited with evil, aren't you? said Billy. I can always tell. It's true, said Mr Gum, jumping up on the counter and dancing around in a bucket of pig's brains. I oh, fancy doing some terrible bad deeds today. Make no mistake. I know what would be funny, said Billy William, scratching his chin with a long unwashed finger. He always pronounced the word funny in this way. Pronouncing words strangely was one of his hobbies, like collecting phlegm or trying to see up ladies' skirts. We could break a skateboard, he suggested. Nah, I've already done that, said Mr Gum impatiently. OK, said Billy William. How about we uh, we stand outside on the street and step on butterflies? It just ain't evil enough, Billy, said Mr Gum, kicking a cow's eyeball across the shop in frustration. What we gonna do? Now just then, the door opened and in came... Alan Taylor. He'd been all over town inviting people to his party and giving out money or making friends as he called it. Unfortunately no one had warned him about Billy Williams otherwise he would have kept well away and as soon as he opened the door and slipped on an eyeball he knew he'd made a biffer of a mistake. But Alan Taylor was a gentleman born and bred, and he remembered his manners as best as he could. <coughs> Greetings, he gabbled, bravely ignoring all the blood and guts and the pile of strange twisty bones on the corner. Uh, I'm, I'm Alan Taylor and I'm having a party tomorrow night on, on Boaster's Hill. Do come along, you're most welcome. A hairy old pig's head fell off a hook, slid down the wall and came rolling slowly towards him. With that, the last of Alan Taylor's courage disappeared. He gave a little help, yelp, threw a handful of money in the air and ran back outside to safety. Oh, did you see that? said Mr Gunn stuffing the cash down his pants where no one would dare to go after it, not even Billy William. I did, replied the dreadful butcher. That little tongue is as rich as a mushroom. Now listen, Mr Gum continued slyly. I want that money, not just a bit of it, but the whole burping lot. And we all need a plan. And that's where you come in. You enormous guff merchant. So get hatching plans like you've never hatched plans before. Uh, right, yo, smirked Billy William. And with that, he closed his eyes and began hatching a plan in perfect silence. He was like a horrible hen, except he hatched plans instead of eggs. And the plans grew into misery instead of chickens. And he didn't have wings or, or a beak or feathers. And he didn't make clucking noises. And he wasn't a hen. Four hours, four hours later, Billy William opened his eyes. Right, I got it, he said. We'll go to Taylor's stupid party. Then when it's dark, we'll sneak up on him and take his biscuit tin. Then we'll escape to France change our names and live like powerful kings on all the cash. Ah, Caterpillar Joe, you're a genius, laughed Mr Gum through a mouthful of entrails. A blibbering genius. That is the end of chapter two. How oh, very exciting. Please tune in next time for chapter three which is called Alan Taylor shows off like nobody's business. <laughs>